Think that headline sounds like clickbait? Well, think again. They banned me on Facebook because of a video I posted 18 months ago. A parody video making fun of feminism, the target of which, Copper Cab, was in on the joke. <laughs> Making fun of feminism is now a bannable offence on Facebook. Remember, this is the guy who wants to be a cult leader and the President of the United States. People being banned on Patreon for having the wrong opinions. People being fired by Google for pointing out scientific facts. Google insiders admitting they game the algorithm to bury search results. And YouTube. Oh, let me tell you about YouTube. One week after they empowered the ADL to police hate speech on YouTube. One week after I warned they would use this to target us. Mass flagging and mass demonetization of pro-Trump accounts across the board. Some people saying 95% of their videos have been affected. Diamond and Silk talking about bringing a class action lawsuit against Google. I just looked and YouTube has literally demonetized every single video I ever made about Islam. They even demonetized a video of me criticizing Modern art. Whistleblowers have confirmed our videos are being hidden from the recommended list. YouTubers who aren't even right wing. People like the amazing atheist losing hundreds of subscribers every time they upload a video. The message is clear. Don't have controversial opinions or you will be punished. Well, I'm sorry, I'm not here to make videos about kittens. I just can't do it. But YouTube's a private company, they can do what they like. Bullshit. Google's a monopoly. There's no competition to YouTube. At this point, Google is the internet. I need to seriously think about whether it's worth investing hundreds and hundreds of hours of my time every year into something that could just completely disappear when I wake up tomorrow morning on a platform owned by Google that has made it abundantly clear they don't support free speech. I mean, I'll probably ride it until the wheels fall off, but this is it for now. We defeated Hillary, we hit a million subscribers, we had a good run. Better to burn out than to fade away. Obviously I was contemplating whether I should do it or not. Hey, we won the argument, but at the end of the day, they own the platform. Maybe, just maybe, we need to support each other more and stop letting our egos get in the way of everything. But the fight will continue elsewhere. Until we're raided and shut down for Russian collusion, Infowars.com will still be around. Let's get it straight. I'm not flouncing. I'm not taking my ball and going home. I'm not going to start crying on camera. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably come back at some point, if I'm not banned. But unless the big prominent YouTubers and the free speech advocates start freaking out about this, like Diamond and Silcar, the die is cast. That's it. I'm done. James Damore, the engineer who wrote a memo saying Google has no tolerance for ideological diversity, was fired by Google, thereby completely proving his point. But wait, this diversity memo must have been chock full of racism and misogyny, right? I mean, look at the reactions. What this employee said indicates discrimination and hostility. Google should fire him. Honestly, if no one is fired over this, Google should just admit their commitment to women is window dressing. I, for one, am okay living in a world where using pseudoscience to promulgate sexism against my co-workers is a fireable offence. If I weren't there, I would just walk to his desk and beat the shit out of him. Must have been pretty bad, right? What did he actually say? Men and women are biologically different and have different skill sets suited to different tasks, a manifestly provable biological fact agreed upon by mainstream science that men tend to occupy more leadership positions because they are under more pressure to be status-driven, that companies like Google discriminate against conservatives because of their political views, that Google has set up a politically correct monoculture in order to enforce an ideological echo chamber that shames dissenters into silence, and that people should be treated as individuals. And for that, James Damore was hunted down, identified identified, publicly shamed and dispensed with for his egregious thought crimes. The further a society drifts from truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. The left is at war with reality. Google is the ministry of truth. James Damore had the temerity to say two plus two equals four. He had the gall to question whether Oceania had always been at war with East Asia. He had the nerve to refuse to participate in the two minutes of hate against conservatives. <laughs> And for that, he was unmasked 
doxxed, witch hunted, publicly shamed and fired, all within the space of three days. War is peace, freedom is slavery, diversity is uniformity. Google's reason for firing Damar was to suggest that he was encouraging an environment of harassment, intimidation, bias and unlawful discrimination. When that's exactly what Damar was trying to expose in his memo. That's exactly what the baying outrage mob did to Damar after he spoke out. Google CEO Sundar Pichai I said the memo might have hurt some Google employees' feelings. <laughs> they too feel under threat and that's not okay. People must feel free to express dissent. Unless you're a white male conservative who expresses dissent, in which case you'll be summarily vilified and kicked out of the door within 48 hours. Yeah, that white male patriarchy that supposedly runs the show didn't help James Damore, did it? His white male privilege didn't do him any favours. And by the way, how safe would conservative employees feel expressing dissent, given that Google's new Vice President of Diversity, Integrity and Governance, Danielle Brown, literally worked for Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. Let's get this straight. This isn't just about one guy losing his job. This is about Google, the company that owns YouTube, making it crystal clear that it's hostile to ideological diversity. The company that has a near monopoly on search traffic. The most powerful corporation in the world in terms of controlling information. Just confirmed they have no interest in tolerating diversity of opinion. Let that sink in. If Google can't handle dissent inside, what makes you think they won't try to suppress it outside? Why do you think they've just empowered the ADL to police hate speech on YouTube? Now another Google insider has gone public to expose how Google is demoting anti-PC search results and anti-Islamic terror search results. They're hiding videos like this one from appearing in recommended videos on YouTube. This is stealth censorship. The rules have changed. It's not the state that's the primary threat to free speech, it's Silicon Valley. It's monolithic corporations staffed by people who think anyone to the right of Jane Fonda is literally Hitler. Airbnb is now banning people from using their service if they have the wrong political views. Oh, but if you're a Christian bakery that politely declines to make a gay wedding cake, the entire apparatus of government and the outrage mob will come crashing down on you. Idea, a directory of known misogynist and racist used to avoid hiring or contracting. Godwin's list, the anti-reference, useful. Put people on lists and collectively punish them for having different opinions, choking their ability to live life. That's progressivism in 2017. Should we be surprised that the same people who for years demanded safe spaces in university, the supposed cradle of free speech and ideas being challenged, are now turning Google, Facebook, Twitter and the rest of them into ideological safe spaces where conservatives are banished. Professors are now even allowing students to change their own grades if their original grade hurt their feelings. What kind of society are we creating? One in which you won't even be able to get a decent job unless you parrot the progressive consensus. One in which you'll be put on a blacklist and made unemployable if you dare voice your conservative opinions. One in which ideological obedience and compliance is ruthlessly enforced by giant monolithic corporations that control reality. That is insidious. It's truly Orwellian. What could be more triggering to libtards than my face and this slogan? Get your new premium quality, conservatism is the new counterculture t-shirt right now at InfoWarsStore.com and let the butt hurt commence. YouTube says it will fight extremist content by censoring controversial videos. Who are they teaming up with to oversee this new program? Must be someone non-partisan, trustworthy, credible. A group that clearly knows the difference between free speech and violent hate speech, right? It's the Anti-Defamation League, the ADL. Oh. Shit. But wait, I mean surely YouTube wouldn't just hand power to those who would easily abuse it. This is a serious organisation. The ADL's bar for hate speech must be pretty high, right? I mean, what is it? Advocating for genocide? Calling for violence against Jews? Oh, they literally think a cartoon frog is hate speech. 
That's how low the bar is. The ADL put the grandson of a survivor of the Nazi occupation on a list alongside actual neo-Nazis and white supremacists simply because he's a conservative. They also listed a bunch of other conservatives next to actual neo-Nazis. Oh, but they're the impartial, rational, neutral outfit that's now going to Thought Police YouTube. They're not partisan at all. So a group whose entire existence and millions of dollars in funding every year relies on fanning hysteria over hate speech is now being given the power by YouTube to patrol hate speech. Gee, what could possibly go wrong? Who else is working with YouTube to patrol hate speech? The Institute for Strategic Dialogue, a group that runs a program on far-right extremism in coordination with the Swedish government. Oh, you mean the same Swedish government that put 14,000 people, most of them conservative commentators, on a Twitter hate speech block list. The same Swedish government that put PewDiePie, a dude whose content consists mostly of him playing video games, on that same hate speech block list. A government that thinks posting factual statistics about the link between migrants and violent crime is an act of hate speech. What could possibly go wrong? Who else gets to decide what is and isn't hate speech on YouTube? The No Hate Speech Movement, a group that says websites that criticise Islam are hate speech. A group that says the President of the United States should be banned from Twitter for hate speech. Yeah, that bar still seems pretty low, doesn't it? But hey, I guess YouTube are just following the example of Twitter and Facebook. When Twitter wanted to crack down on abuse and harassment, they teamed up with feminists who think telling them they suck is abuse and harassment. Everything is sexist. Everything is racist. Everything is homophobic. When Facebook wanted to crack down on fake news, they teamed up with Snopes, the credible, independent outlet that isn't left of Stalin and doesn't embezzle money to spend on luxury vacations and prostitutes. Oh, but don't worry, because YouTube says they're not going to censor controversial videos. They're just going to hide them, make sure they can't appear in the recommended bar, be liked or commented on. But they're not censoring them, honest. Let's get real. In the context of politics, the right has completely taken over YouTube. Even Vice.com had to admit it. The adpocalypse was only the beginning. Unless we bitch and moan about this over and over again, this is the start of the purge. And even if you're not a conservative, you should still be alarmed. They're going after anyone who isn't advertiser friendly, which is basically anyone outside the limits of the narrow consensus of opinion that they subjectively define. Maybe we have allies within the company that can put a stop to this. But unless we fight back, this is the beginning of the end for free speech on YouTube. What could be more triggering to libtards than my face and this slogan? Get your new premium quality, conservatism is the new counterculture t-shirt right now at InfoWarsStore.com and let the butt hurt commence. Good evening, London. That title got your attention, didn't it? Well, I wish it was clickbait, but it's not. Many of your favourite YouTubers could be about to disappear. And it's odd because many of the same people who went ape shit over YouTube heroes aren't even talking about this. Basically, a bunch of corporations had a collective hissy fit because their ads were showing up on extremist videos. Verizon, Johnson & Johnson, these big companies, they've just found out that their ads are being played before some pretty offensive content and they want it to stop. And to be fair, you can understand why they don't want to be seen as endorsing extremism. Because by extremism, we just mean ISIS. We mean jihadist propaganda. Beheading videos, right? Wrong. According to the media, extremist YouTubers include yours truly, John Tron, and PewDiePie. PewDiePie! Let us dwell for a second on how truly hysterical you must be to think that a guy who makes funny videos about playing computer games is a political extremist. <sighs> 
So the media is exploiting the contrived moral panic started by these corporations to pressure YouTube into silencing us all. So why do they want to censor me? Well, it's because it's because I'm kicking their ass and they can't win the argument on a level playing field. So I tweeted, Twitter is a tiny echo chamber. I'm not sure the left understand the monumental ass whooping being dished out to them on YouTube. And it triggered a huge number of frothing leftists to angrily deny that it was true. Which is how I knew it was true. Even Vice was forced to admit, quote, Paul Joseph Watson is right in an article entitled Why the Right is Dominating YouTube. And it is true. Virtually every SJW or regressive left video on YouTube gets absolutely slaughtered in the comments and has overwhelming thumbs down. We're clearly winning the argument because most leftists are incredibly lazy and would rather virtue signal on Twitter than go through the laborious process of scripting, filming, and editing videos. Because their idea of debate consists of using minorities as human shields and calling you a racist. Which is not an argument, and not having an argument doesn't translate well to YouTube. So instead of challenging our ideas with better ideas, like it works in, oh, I don't know, a civil society, they're just going to censor us by labelling us extremists. Don't believe me? It's already happening. Polygon said my YouTube channel was part of a sexist and racist hate movement. In that Vice article I just mentioned, they say PewDiePie is, quote, far right, despite the fact that he doesn't even talk about politics. And that he's causing millions of kids to become anti-Semites because he jokes about shooting Hitler in the balls in a video game. And that's... Why Hitler never had any babies. Yes, really. In another Vice article, they say John Tron is making all the kids racist. New Statesman said my videos were racist in an article about who YouTube should censor. Along with all the fake news hysteria, they're clearly building the narrative that anyone who even hints at challenging leftist dogma on anything is an extremist and must be silenced. They're clearly conflating actual extremism, like ISIS beheading videos, with people who just have a different fucking opinion. And again, it's because we're crushing them. Their audience is shrinking. Their trustworthiness, especially amongst young people, is collapsing. So how will they silence us pesky YouTubers with our wrong think and inconvenient opinions? Well, let me introduce you to YouTube Restricted Mode. Here's my channel on Restricted Mode. Yeah, you'll notice every single one of my videos has disappeared. Here's CNN on Restricted Mode. Not a single one of their videos has been buried. Even though I talk about many of the same news issues as CNN. Same issues Wrong opinion. So it's bye bye PJW. Here's Philip DeFranco's channel, Stephen Crowder. Here's Alex Jones. Here's PewDiePie. Every single video is gone. Here's CNBC. Here's NBC. Again, they talk about many of the exact same issues as me, and yet none. Not a single one of their videos is buried. This is the sterile, controversy free advertiser-friendly environment that YouTube wants. There are, of course, those who do not want us to speak. So you know how YouTube slaps an age restriction on your videos and it forces people to have to sign into their accounts to watch them? That immediately kills the momentum for your video and stops it going viral. And that's what they'll do with this restricted mode. They'll force people to sign in and age verify to see every single upload from those of us that have been put on the naughty step. It's coming. Which of course will virtually kill all our channels and completely demotivate us from making more videos. This all makes sense given that YouTube is partnering up with major corporations to basically turn itself into a conventional TV channel. And telling the truth is just not advertiser friendly. We're not welcome anymore. Google must walk a fine line between giving advertisers more control and alienating the massive community of content creators who've made the site a top destination for coveted young viewers. From a censorship angle, it will also prevent millions of young people from being red-pilled on important political subjects. Because they just won't be able to see our videos organically. And that makes sense because Generation Z is already leaning more conservative and the establishment is in a blind panic about it. Listen to what Google's Eric Schmidt said. Google can build products that move extreme content down in the rankings. Again, who's extreme? Well, it's me. It's Alex Jones. It's PewDiePie. 
We're all Nazis now. It should be possible for computers to detect malicious, misleading and incorrect information and essentially have you not see it. We're not arguing for censorship, we're arguing just take it off the page. Oh, we're not going to censor you, we're just going to make sure that nobody can see your videos. Oh gee, thanks. And there's already speculation that YouTube is deliberately unsubscribing people from channels based on age if those channels are deemed edgy in any way. If this YouTube age gate really does exist. It would explain why Leafy is here, uh, a YouTuber who has extremely uh, edgy adult content, would be losing subscribers every single day because the majority of his fan base, I would assume, are, are younger. As I said, when I heard this, bells were ringing. I was shocked, but that wasn't it. There was more to the story. The YouTube employee went on to say that they're planning on implementing this across YouTube and that if you are not in the age group appropriate for that channel, you won't even be able to search it and find it anymore once they fully roll out the program. But YouTube's a private company. It can censor who it likes. Yeah, isn't it funny how leftists are suddenly so vehemently in favor of the right of private companies to discriminate against people? But only when that discrimination involves censoring conservatives. Refuse to bake a gay wedding cake and that fervent principle suddenly washes away. And forget conservatives. Any popular YouTuber with any influence whatsoever poses a threat to the media's monopoly on controlling public opinion. That's why YouTube tried to pay off people to support Hillary Clinton. <coughs> Casey Neistat. That's what frightens them. The mere threat of a thought crime being committed. Words will always retain their power. Words are for the means to meaning, and for those who will listen, the enunciation of truth. So what's the solution? Oh, I don't know, maybe to remind YouTube that freedom of speech is a fundamental bedrock of everything that we stand for in a civilized society. Maybe to point out that it was people like PewDiePie and others who helped build YouTube and make it a global phenomenon in the first place. Maybe to make the point that if you move the Overton window to such a degree that a dude who is totally non-political and plays fucking video games becomes a far-right extremist, then that poses a direct threat to any opinions that diverge from the mainstream. That completely chills free speech and makes everyone afraid of saying anything, creating a boring, sterile society with zero diversity of thought. And where once you had the freedom to object, to think and speak as you saw fit, you now have sensors and systems of surveillance coercing your conformity and selecting your submission. We need cameras. How did this happen? Who's to blame? Enforced totalitarian compliance with whatever the thought police mob demands of you. Or maybe you just want to continue watching PewDiePie shoot Nazis in the balls. Ooh, I never get tired of that. Either way, the die is cast. From YouTube heroes to countering extremism. It's all a scam. It's all a scheme by the failing establishment media to silence its competition. And if we don't get mad about this, if we don't get engaged, it will succeed. Fairness, justice, and freedom are more than words. They are perspectives. Dave Cullen, the Twitter is Dave Cullen CF. Dave, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Paul. Now, I just want to start off with what we were covering before the break. Again, when we talk about censorship, every time the argument comes back, you know, Facebook's a private company, YouTube's a private company, they can censor who they want. Well, one, you look at Google, which owns YouTube, it's a monopoly. It's crossed that line from being just a private company. Now you have to basically use their services to do anything on the internet in terms of content creation. So it's no longer just a private company, it's a monopoly. And then the other issue which we can talk about is they're working hand in hand in Europe, in the Middle East, with governments to literally target thought criminals. In Germany, you've got people being reported to the government. They get home visits from the police. 
for Facebook posts about their government's migrant policy in Pakistan. Now, we have a headline out of Reuters. Pakistan says Facebook vows to tackle concerns over blasphemous content. So Facebook is working directly with the Pakistani government to hunt down thought criminals. You have a guy, Ayaz Nizami, who faces the death penalty for leaving the religion of Islam, for criticizing Islam in Pakistan. Now Facebook is going to help the government target people like him who face execution. So Dave, I mean, it really goes beyond the argument of it's just a private company when you've got these social media networks working hand in hand with government to harass people, to target thought criminals, right? Yeah, but in, on the plus side, Paul, I mean, all the really cool people are going to be in the gulags, aren't they? Um, <laughs> quite honestly, look, what we're dealing with here is the fact, and I've said this before, the, the legislation, the proposed legislation and the bills that are coming down the line from governments were working in uh, tandem with the social networks, as we know, like the, uh, the EU hate speech code that Twitter, Microsoft, YouTube all signed up to last year, as well as Facebook. They sound very similar to community guidelines on a social network. They would not be out of place with something that you would read on a social justice college campus. Now, I actually spoke to Andrew Torba, who's the, the CEO of uh, Gab.ai, which is the new free speech uh, Twitter alternative that you probably heard about for all the wrong reasons, because everybody has smeared it as the new alt-right Twitter. It's anything but. And, you know, he was speaking to me about the level of hit pieces that they're receiving. But what's truly disturbing and Orwellian about all of this is the fact that you talk about the private companies, you talk about the monopolies they have. They also have so much of an ecosystem. You have the likes of Apple that will not let the Gab app into their iOS app store. Now, this obviously means that iOS users on their iPhone and their iPad are not going to be able to get access to this application because it's been smeared as something through a series of hit pieces. You're absolutely right. I mean, if you look at the private company argument, imagine your computer is your home and outside on the street is the internet. Okay, but what if the street is owned by a corporation? If you're not on Google, if your site isn't ranking on Google, or if it's been buried in a McCarthyite style blacklist, you have no comeback. Everyone you know is, is operating on six or seven major social networks, Twitter, Facebook, uh, the likes of Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube, Google, whatever. If, the, if you're not there, if you've been blocked from that, you're effectively cut off from the internet. And now governments are actively moving to potentially silence these new sites altogether. It's, this is the next thing is going to be banning at the level of the ISP for uh, political dissenters going to these new social networks. No, I mean, that's it. It's the equivalent of the ISP directly cutting off someone's internet connection if they visit political websites that are deemed inappropriate by the ISP. It's got to that level now. So this private company argument may, it may have worked years ago. It's completely bit in the dust by now. Let's get into YouTube because... You know, we've had this moral panic led by huge corporations about so-called extremist content appearing on YouTube. But, you know, Dave, why would anyone have a problem with that? I mean, we're just talking about jihadist propaganda and beheading videos, right? Well, y you would think, but as it turns out, <laughs> you know, it's, it's such a laugh. Really, it's, it's corporate culture that does not understand Internet culture at all. You talk about the culture wars, I've talked about them as well. The cultural zeitgeist is something that major corporates do not understand. You walk into any major multinational, they all subscribe to social justice. They all subscribe to, you know, feminism and diversity hires and all this kind of stuff and affirmative action. And so you have the likes of Audi, who actually were one of the first to pull out of the AdSense system only days ago. And a few months ago, I made a video responding to their absolutely ridiculous video in which they talked about the gender pay gap. And then, of course, embarrassingly had to walk it back in a tweet and you have them, and now you have the likes of, um, you know, both Kia and I believe it was Holden in car manufacturers in Australia saying, yeah, it's actually MGTOW videos. MGTOW is basically guys who don't want to have had anything to do with, with relationships with women. They don't want to get married. Sound like ISIS to me, Paul. Uh, the <laughs> likes of guys who are MRAs, who are fighting for men's rights, talking about unfair custody, uh, divorce settlements and things like that in child custody, talking about men's depression, important issues the mainstream won't touch. And then, of course, anti-feminism. 
what we're supposed to support this socially corrosive cultural Marxist ideology of misandry that makes, you know, men and women completely unhappy and has destroyed marriage in the Western world. Yeah, that's the kind of extremism they're talking about, Paul. That's the extremism. Any narrative whatsoever that runs counter to theirs. Now I'm seeing completely demonetization of entire channels taking place. They seem to be doing it on the content of the speech in the videos, Dave, because we noticed that with this new YouTube restricted mode, entire channels were wiped clean. My channel, Alex Jones's channel, numerous other channels. But when you look at CNN, when you look at NBC, mysteriously, they're not afflicted by the same restriction process. Again, despite the fact that they cover many of the exact same issues. So, Dave, do you think they've just got complete immunity on everything, or are they just going through transcribed content of speech on YouTube now to decide who gets put on the naughty step? Yeah, the demonetization as far back as we know from last year when it began, when they introduced that line about controversial or sensitive subjects and events, including subjects related to war, political uh, conflicts, natural disasters and tragedies, even if graphic imagery is not shown. I mean, come on, that is written specifically, Paul, to try to make it impossible for alternative grassroots independent news journalism to happen. So when you read that, you knew immediately they had preferred news partners. CNN and others, and they aren't affected, as you say, quite rightly, by restricted mode. Stephen Crowder's on the right. He do, he takes great pains not to swear. His channel's com completely gone. PewDiePie as well. Someone as, I think, is relatively safe on the center left, because I don't really think it's completely a right-left issue, is someone like Philip DeFranco. It's anybody in the alternative media who poses a threat to them. And quite honestly, if you look at YouTube TV, which is really where this is, is going to, all of the preferred partners over on YouTube, YouTube TV, including in the entertainment industry, the old guard, old guard entertainment industry, and the mainstream news media, of course, they're preferred partners of YouTube. Of course, they are going to get complete immunity from any level of restriction or demonetization for that matter. And it's, it's really the double standard that gets me. I mean, the amount of times I've reported direct death threats and the email comes back from Facebook, from Twitter. This doesn't violate our community standards. Meanwhile, you've got absolute virulent racism on a daily basis. You have death threats. You have people doxing people's addresses, which literally just happened to someone I know today. He reported it. It's under police investigation, and yet Twitter still refuses to suspend this account. We had another example with uh, Cassandra Fairbanks, where they were directly threatening her children with harm this Antifa account, it went on for almost a week, day after day, threats, violent threats towards children. Must have been thousands of people reporting these tweets to Twitter. It took a week. It took a big Infowars expose article to finally get, get them to shut down this account. Meanwhile, Dave, you go on Facebook and use the word faggot, as in, you know, Milo Yiannopoulos' dangerous faggot tour, that's his name for it. People are getting 30 day bans. So really, it's the double standard that gets me. Or a faggot of sticks, of course, let's not forget, Paul. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's just interesting when you mention Twitter, because, I mean, they are effectively trying to radicalize people against Donald Trump. It's his most, uh, you know, a most used platform. He's famous, of course, for using his Twitter to circumnavigate the lying, dying, fake news mainstream media. And what do you see? A complete manipulation. It's not surprising that all of these accounts that you reference are operating without any kind of uh, impunity. So what you have is when you go to, to Trump's Twitter, if he tweets something, everything underneath his tweets is negative. And it's all coming from verified Twitter account, leftists, of course, the positive account, the positive comments, the, hey, you're doing a great job, Mr. President, hashtag MAGA, all that stuff is disconnected from the discussion thread within minutes or hours or buried. And so this is another you, blatant you example. that they were actually taking those responses out, correct? Uh, yes, it was actually a gentleman who covered it originally. I believe his name is Mike Keane. Um, and then I conducted my own experiments and then had my own Twitter users go ahead and do the same thing. And everybody was able to corroborate exactly what we'd, uh, what we'd known for some time. Something was up. And of course, when you go to Trump's Facebook, nothing but positivity, because Twitter is the one that is, uh, you know, basically manipulating its algorithm. And you just look back one year from now, Paul, uh, one year ago. Uh, I, on the 9th of March, Lauren Southern launched the hashtag the triggering, 
Okay. Now, that was all very funny, designed to trigger social justice warriors. Wow, what a, what a difference a year has made. Imagine trying to get that to rank on Twitter now. The trending feed there is not an actual trending feed. It's a curated hashtag feed in exactly the same way as YouTube's trending feed is not a trending feed. It's all curated content. It's all safe. Nothing controversial or anti-leftist is going to be ranking over on YouTube. And that's exactly where these social networks are going. Um, so it's worrying times ahead for sure. I mean, Facebook got caught gaming their algorithm for the trending list to bury conservative subjects. Twitter has never admitted to that as far as I know. But if you look, every single week they have an article by a guy called Charles M. Blow, I think his name is, a New York Times writer, big social justice leftist writer. Every single week when he releases his big article, the headline trends on Twitter. That is some kind of agreement they've got going on. You look at the tables, the graphs for the amount of interaction hashtags are getting, you can have conservative, pro-conservative, pro-libertarian, whatever, pro-Trump hashtags getting 10 times the amount of engagement as something that benefits a leftist narrative. You will never see the first, the pro-conservative hashtag on Twitter. So they are gaming the algorithm. It's not a fair system. It's a completely rigged game. I mean, do you think this is, this is a lost cause or can we reach out to people within Twitter, within Facebook and YouTube you know, are there people on our side that are fighting against this inside these corporations, do you think? I very much doubt it, particularly with YouTube. I think when you look at what they want to do with YouTube TV, which is basically handed over to the old guard media, both in terms of entertainment and news media. Look, the old guard media, whether it's Sci-Fi Channel or Disney, whatever, I mean, you can see now why Maker had to drop PewDiePie. Because, I mean, obviously you can't have an edgelord knocking around on what is going to be a version of YouTube that is designed for on-demand television. It's going to be made safe. They want you back on the couch consuming media in the old way on television. And that's the reason why they have bigger plans here. And these entertainment providers, what they actually want to do is they want to take the eyes away from the gamers on YouTube who get you know, millions of subscribers or the beauty bloggers. They don't care whether, you're poli whether your, your stuff is political or not. Obviously, the people who are political are the first to go for sure, but they will come for everybody else as well. So I don't think these platforms really are savable, which is why I think people should be getting on Minds.com. I'm there myself, so are you. I speak regularly to Bill Ottman of Minds.com. He's the, the co-founder of the organization, and he's very, very committed to, uh, to free speech. And I'll say this, uh, I asked him recently what he would do if Minds was hit with the same penalty that Facebook and Twitter are facing now in Germany, $50 million fines if they don't, remo don't remove hate speech. And he said, we just have to leave Germany. And this is the problem. This is what governments are going to be doing, Paul. I think this is a, a war we need to fight on a few levels. Yes, we need to move to the likes of vid.me, who seem more committed to free speech than YouTube. Minds.com, who seem more committed to, to free speech than Facebook and Twitter. Yes, we need to go there to gab as well. But I think people need at this point, particularly when those sites start getting flagged or start getting blocked at the level of the ISP by governments, we will need to start to take to the streets with free speech protests of some kind in major cities. And I say this because look at the Women's March, it was global. We need to do the same kind of thing because quite honestly, if we lose the internet, all we have left is the streets. I mean, it's incredible. I think the only thing to do at this point is to ride it until the wheels fall off. I mean, we can continue going. The problem is for most people, of course, and this doesn't affect me, I don't get the money from the YouTube video content. You know, I get paid directly by Infowars, which is good because these hundreds, maybe even thousands of people now who make not just political commentary, but just, you know, engaging with funny memes, which is basically what PewDiePie does at this point, playing video games. His control, his influence, the fact that he's got 54 million subscribers petrifies them to such a degree. They ran that giant out of context hit piece on him. All the other leftist media outlets regurgitated it without question. You know, what are we going to do? Are we just going to ride it until the wheels fall off? Are we going to move to these networks? Are we going to have a unified uh, backlash where we all leave YouTube and Twitter simultaneously? I reckon we just ride it until the wheels fall off and then we move on to these networks that we've already been, you know, building up in the background. 
I agree uh, to a certain extent. What I would add to that is I think that the audiences, and the audiences are critical here. Look, these organizations are so dumb. They think that all they have to do is get rid of you and me and people like us. And then our audiences will just, like sheep, just go back and watch CNN and believe all the lies again. Once you've been red-pilled, you don't go back to being a feminist after you realize that it's all bull. All right, that's it. Once you're out of the matrix, there's no going back. The audiences are hungry for this content. This content is what made YouTube what it is. And now they're basically selling out the content creators and the audiences to what? Make YouTube back to television, which is what we were trying to get away from to try and find interesting uh, thought leaders like yourself. Well, I think there is that. And I do think what we need to do is hit the advertisers in the pocket. And they need to be red pilled. They need to understand that we're not gonna stand for this because if there's an economic model for free speech to continue, and there needs to be in a democratic society, then I think that's where it begins. And that's the point. I mean, what kind of advertisements does Fox News and CNN take? It's all heart pills. I mean, CNN has to fund itself with, you know, loans and gifts from Bahraini government and these other Gulf state dictatorships. These other groups have to take big fat checks from George Soros. They can't survive and thrive in a truly egalitarian capitalist system. We are crushing them on every single level, Dave. You know, Vice came out with an article about a week ago. I think you posted it. We're going to skip this break, by the way, so we got a good eight minutes left. Vice came out with an article which admitted, quote, the right was dominating YouTube. Now, you can call it the right, but as, as you mentioned, it's not even the right. Philip DeFranco is not right wing, and yet every single one of his videos is restricted, buried on restricted mode. PewDiePie isn't even political. He plays around with some jokey memes. They absolutely slammed him. So people have to understand this is going to affect everyone. But I mean, that's the point, isn't it? We, it's going to literally destroy people's careers. I got an email from someone today who said, you know, he had a few thousand subscribers on his channel, ranted a couple of times about feminism. They deleted his channel entirely. So it's about that chilling effect. But they need to realize, as you made the point, all the eyes are going to be on our content. You can't win back that audience. Trust in mainstream media, especially amongst young people, is completely collapsing. We have the audience. They can't compete with us in a truly egalitarian capitalist model. The projection shows them going off a cliff. So they always have to rig the game, Dave. But in the long term, that is not going to be financially rewarding for any advertisers, correct? No, it's not. Uh, we still have the numbers. And the other thing is what we I think we really need to reach out and, and develop our own platforms, specifically around advertising, something like FameBit, which now conveniently Google has actually purchased. But there are there are entities, there are organizations, there are right wing advertisers out there who are absolutely willing so they don't, they're either politically neutral or they're right wing where they do support what we do. And it's those people that we really need to reach out. There is a means of actually keeping this going. And yes, it is heartbreaking to know that it will create a chilling effect. So many people in the, in the YouTube so-called skeptic community are going to, and, and again, that's a, that's a very broad term because it's people across the left and the right of the spectrum. We disagree on many, many things and it, it might be minutia at the end of the day. We can agree that an absolutist interpretation of free speech is the only way that we can have a functioning democracy. And this is the, this is the really important point. So people will be kept alive on things like Patreon. So if you have a, a content creator, until they perhaps try to shut that down, if you have a favorite content creator, you should try to support them because I think crowdfunding is going to become absolutely instrumental. And then going forward, there will be other ways that we can out innovate this. I regularly speak to developers that are looking at new ways to develop new types of ad platforms that will be decentralized and that won't be under the control of large corporates like these. We have minds.com, which of course I'm a member of, you're a member of, we've got gab.ai. Uh, other platforms where people can find your information, tell people about your YouTube channel while it's still up there, and your Twitter <laughs> account. Yeah, well, I'm on uh, YouTube. It's uh, the channel is called Computing Forever. Uh, it used to be a tech channel, and then I realized there's actually more important existential threats in the in the world. Uh, I'm on I'm on Twitter there at uh, Dave Cullen CF. You can also find me on Minds.com. I really recommend people join up to that because it's all about free speech. At Dave Cullen, also at Dave Cullen on Gab.ai. There I am taking a shot. Fantastic. <laughs> all right, we'll leave it there. Check out Dave. It's Computing Forever on YouTube. Uh, just search for Dave Cullen on Twitter and check out his recent video about YouTube censorship. That is a key video. Dave, thanks for joining us.
Thank you, Paul. Welcome. I appreciate each of you coming and testifying today. You know, I recognize that a lot of folks in the media are, and even some members of this committee, are praising your companies for taking active steps to police some of the content on your sites. Uh, but I have to note that doing so raises troublesome concerns at the same time, uh, particularly given the percentage of news and political information that Americans receive online through social media or through other online avenues, the prospect of Silicon Valley companies actively censoring the speech or the news content is troubling to anyone who cares about a democratic process with a robust First Amendment. Take one example, uh, which is Google. In December of 2015, a professor at Northwestern University conducted a study analyzing Google search results. He searched for the names of all 16 presidential candidates at the time and discovered that Democrats on average had seven favorable search results among Google's top 10, and Republican candidates had 5.9 positive articles. And indeed, of the major candidates at the time, Hillary Clinton had five positive search results and only one negative on the first page. Donald Trump had four positive and three negative search results on the first page. Bernie Sanders had nine positive results without a single negative result on the first page. And a final candidate, the junior senator from Texas, had a total of zero positive results on the first page. You may well have been citing my colleague from Minnesota on that page. That is outrageous. I, I will note, I will say if there were a Franken filter, that might be popular. That same professor ran a second study and found the vast majority of news outlets that were represented in Google searches were left-leaning. It's not just Google. In 2016, it was revealed that Facebook was, quote, curating the list of trending news stories on their website. According to reports, Facebook workers were artificially spiking conservative stories, including stories about former IRS official Lois Lerner, former Navy SEAL Chris Kyle, and positive stories about conservative politicians. The reports also revealed that stories by conservative outlets like the Washington Examiner or Newsmax that were popular enough to be picked up by Facebook's trending stories algorithm were nonetheless excluded until the New York Times and CNN began covering the same stories. Just last month, Twitter barred Representative Marsha Blackburn from advertising her campaign launch video because it deemed a line about her efforts to investigate Planned Parenthood to be inflammatory. The Susan B. Anthony list recently had a video advertisement against a political candidate blocked on Twitter because it referred to partial birth abortion as being akin to infanticide. Now, that, those are all political positions that people can take in our democratic society. But it is disconcerting if those political positions become a lens through which the American consumers consume news. So I want to ask each of you, do you consider your sites, Mr. Edgett and Mr. Stretch, uh, to be neutral public fora? Senator, Senator we, th we think of Facebook as a platform for all ideas, and we, we have 
boundaries in the sense that we don't permit certain categories of content such as hate speech, but within those guidelines, we do not in any way discriminate on the basis of viewpoint or ideology. So I, I'm just trying to understand, is that a yes or no whether you consider yourself to be a, a, a neutral public forum? We don't, use, we don't think of it in the terms of neutral because what we're trying to do actually is provide each user a personalized news feed that will be the content that's most interesting to that user. But we do think of ourselves as, again, within the boundaries that I described, open to all ideas without regard to viewpoint or ideology. Mr. Edgett, same question. Uh, free expression and uh, free speech is at the core of, of the Twitter Twitter mission, and we do everything we can to enable that. Uh, obviously, balancing things like Mr. Stretch said against violence, uh, violent threats, or abuse and harassment. But we believe that allowing the public and open platform that the Twitter serves its community is one that's important to debate and discussion. And Mr. Chairman, if I can ask a final question, I'm at the end of my time. I, but I, I how, just, how do you respond, Chairman? Last Chairman, I checked, I'm, I'm not going to object, but I would note that. Chairman, you and I are the only two who sat through all of this today, and I would like to have a chance to ask a question yeah, before you will, vote. Quick over. question. But of course, I'll let Senator Cruz go ahead. Go ahead. How do both of you respond to the public concerns and growing concerns that your respective company and other Silicon Valley companies are putting a thumb on the scale of political debate and shifting it in ways consistent with the political views uh, of your employees? Senator, again, we, we think of ourselves as a platform of all idea, for all ideas, and we, and we aspire to that. We are acutely aware of the possibility of unconscious bias across a range of issues, uh, not just politics, and we train our employees on that for that precise reason. We want to make sure that people's own biases are not brought to bear in how we manage the platform. Similar at Facebook or at Twitter, we are spending a lot of time training these employees who are looking at user reports on organic tweets. Um, we have stricter policies around advertisements. The one you referenced is an example of that, where uh, since we are serving those ads to, to, to folks who aren't following the accounts and haven't asked to see the content, we want to make sure it's always a positive experience. But even there, we're making tough calls and we're learning from, from mistakes and revising policies and procedures going forward. But, but our goal and our, one of our fundamental principles at the company is to remain impartial. Thank you.